Uh, we're in Mark chapter 6, and here's what's going on for those of you that have not been with us, lots of guests here today. Um, Jesus had just sent his apostles out to, with all the power and authority that he has, okay? Then he moves into his hometown and begins to speak on behalf of the gospel, full of the Spirit, and he gets rejected. Anybody ever tried to share the gospel inside your own family or with people that you know really well? Uh, even for the Son of Glory, even for Jesus, the King of all who is, that had to hurt. The human side of him had to feel that. We all think, well, Jesus can handle anything. Well, the human side, the 100% human side, probably felt like you did when that happened if you felt full rejection. And then last week we uh, took a little time away from Jesus' activity and looked at the death of John the Baptist. We talked about conscience. So let's pick up where we left off in Mark chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 30. Those of you that have a Bible, you're welcome to join me there. Or you can pick it up on your phone, check Facebook, and pretend like you're reading the Bible. It'd be fantastic. Get that text that just popped in. Verse 30 says this, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. Those are fun times, right? When there's been amazing things happening, we celebrate. The church needs to celebrate more, yes? We need to celebrate that God is winning some victories among us. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. He can see fatigue on their face. And for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. They didn't have time to eat. And they went away in a boat to a, by themselves to a desolate place. Now many saw them going. So the crowd says, wait a minute, there's our, there's our health factors, there's our triage people, there's our food factory, uh, and they run ahead from foot, uh, on foot from all the towns that got ahead of them. So we have tired disciples returning from a wonderful but exhausting ministry. Think about this. They had the full power and authority of Jesus. They healed sick folks all over the place. They had triage happening throughout towns. They had to rely on Jesus completely. They were completely dependent, and this is going to show up because he actually sent them out without enough to take care of themselves so that they would have to and it made me think of a psalm where uh, the, the prayer goes something like this. God, give me just enough so that I'm not going to steal, but don't give me too much in that I forget that I need you. Americans can't even begin to look at that psalm. We have no concept of that song. We are so surrounded by everything that we need. We have no perception of that song whatsoever unless we put ourselves in a spiritual place where that would be so, Yes. And so I'm encouraging you to try to get that figured out in the middle of our American culture where we really never are in that much need that we would begin to be able to say that prayer, that we would find ways to be some so spiritually needy that we would not need to steal, stay in triage. That's, by the way, staying in triage is stealing because we steal people who are trying to be on the mission of the glory of God. And here's what happened. Jesus says, hey, man, you guys are tired. Let's rest. Let's rest. But broken people, triage people, have a different agenda for them. And that's actually life and the mission on, on the gospel, right? Those of you that have ever, like, just made yourself available to people, you know that's actual life, right? I mean, like, like I'm tired today. I really would like to rest today. But people have a different idea for you. But here's something you must realize. Let's, let's, let's think about a couple of other little things that are going on here. It says that they were in a desolate place. And the book of Hebrews is going to tell us that Jesus is the better Moses. And so as you're hearing this maybe uh, story that you've heard dozens of times, if you've been around church your whole life, maybe you haven't been around church, so this is fresh for you. We're glad you're here. But if you've been around church your whole life and you've heard this miracle many times, maybe there would be something fresh fall on you today. If you just think about this, that this is a desolate place, it's intentionally showed to be a desert, and so we get this Moses in the wilderness con connection. So don't miss this, that Jesus, the greater Moses, is on the scene here that the writer of Hebrews later will make such a big deal about it. But understand this, Jesus needs a jolt anyway, because he's probably a little bit dejected. He, he's glad the disciples are back telling 
uh, good stories. Even the Son of God gets dejected. Aren't you kind of glad that he uh, feels everything that we feel? You know, the Bible says that there's nothing that you're experiencing today emotionally that he hasn't. The only thing he, you experience that he has in his sin, like, like, and that's the only thing, kind of the only thing we bring to the table anyway, but we, he felt everything that you feel. And so if you're like in a, uh, you know, just in a depressed state today or a dejected state today, understand this, the 100% human side of Jesus knows exactly how you feel. As he indwells you, he has felt what you're feeling. And so rejection like fatigue is just a part of gospel mission. I think, I think sometimes people as they search for church worlds today are searching for perfection and safety and that thing is, things are always clean and and, and what they would consider appropriate, and the problem with that is, is that world doesn't exist, first of all. And then the second thing is that's not where Jesus wants us anyway. He wants us in, uh, in the middle of a mess so he can grow us up. Verse 34, when he saw a shore, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had, say this with me, compassion on them. Jesus is tired, disappointed, and in the middle, of, when he sees broken people in triage, he doesn't say, hey, you know what you guys need to do? You need to go get a job. You need to just pick yourselves up and do better. He doesn't do that. He does different than me. He loves them, and he shows compassion on them. And listen to this. It says, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Assume that the people around you are like sheep without a shepherd. Don't assume that they're doing well. Don't assume that they're... They're hooked in with that which would be healthy for them. Assume they're a sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. That is, uh, for the folks at City on a Hill, those folks who are looking at how to be a disciple, who can make other disciples, that is your life as a family of missionary servants. See, love to a neighbor is not convenient. Part of our problem in our American way of doing things is that we want to work love for neighbor into around our schedule. The problem with that is, is that's not love. Agape, love, just happens through our schedule. It's not always tidy. It does not always come when you've had a great night's rest. It does not always come when you've eaten but compassion sometimes just can't wait. Let me, let me tell you a story from 2005. I <clears throat> preached a, an entire weekend. There was something at the church particularly that was, that was uh, exciting. And I preached, say, like, like Mark Sigma did yesterday or Friday, twice on Saturday. I preached again on Sunday. And on, on Sunday afternoon, I received a phone call. And um, I was literally starving. I had not eaten all morning, fasted that morning, and uh, needed a nap, honestly. And it was Stanley Hall on the phone, and I don't know if you know that name, but Stanley Hall was famous for um, kidnapping a lady named Barbara Jo Woods from the South County Mall, took her to the Chain of Rocks Bridge, and murdered her violently and threw her off the bridge. And it was his execution day. And I knew Stanley. And Stanley calls and says, uh, I need to talk to you. <laughs> well, in that moment, I couldn't say, uh, hey, dude, like, can we do this tomorrow? I want you to hear that. He didn't have a tomorrow. There was no tomorrow. It was urgent. He was washing up on the shore, and uh, he's on the shore, and I was washing up on the shore, and I looked on a, on a people that needed, there were sheep without a shepherd. I couldn't say, hey, man, like, I've got two jobs. I've preached five times in the last three days. I'm exhausted. I have not eaten, and I'm whipped. He, listen to me. He had no tomorrow. And so I spent emotional hours crying and sobbing with this man. And it's so compelling, I can't even tell you when the next time was that I ate. I wasn't worried about eating. I can't tell you the next time that I slept because it would have been, it would have been a rather inappropriate to be with him and then him be executed at midnight and me just comfortably sleeping through his execution. The little other agendas on my to-do list, anybody else got those? Like you write them down, 
you're really organized as you got this to do this. I, I can't tell you what was on that list. I, I can't tell you what, what happened for the next few days off the to-do list because it really wasn't very important. Stanley Hall was on death row, a devout Muslim, and a few hours from lethal injection, and he wanted Jesus. But he was a sheep without a shepherd, and I don't know why, but he chose me. Honored for sure. But I'll be honest, I wanted to sleep for a week after that emotional roller coaster. He died at midnight. I believe he received Christ. It's going to be interesting someday when I close my eyes for the last time to see if I get to hug Jesus and then look over and see Stanley hanging out, right? Redemption. Some of you got some mixed emotions in your souls right now. You know, Barbara Joe Wood's family wasn't really excited about hearing about the redemption story. They weren't really excited about me. Am I tracking where I'm going here? Our sins have earthly consequences. This earth is hard, right? You go, man, I wish there was some other way around all that. There wasn't. So we walked right in the teeth of it. And like I said, those folks, some folks were not happy with God's work. How do you feel right now? I mean, like, what's going on inside you right now? I mean, like, uh, Stan, in your, some part of you think Stanley needs to burn in hell? They thought so. They let some people know. There's a side of us that on this side here, we would kind of like to be full judge, full jury, full executioner, the whole thing. And, and, and if you think that's not true, you've got some relationships in your life that you've done that with. You've been full judge, full jury, and full executioner of that relationship. Those people might be breathing, but they ain't breathing in your soul. But this is the way of Jesus, right? I mean, we, we got to think, is my heart holier than Stanley Hall's? You got to understand, as I'm crying with him, I'm thinking, what part of you is in me? And what part of me doesn't need Jesus as much as you? Like, you've been, you need to track all that in your soul today. It is worth your time to do. What's the difference between me and Stanley Hall? I would, my conclusion at the end of it was there was absolutely none. We were the same person. He just acted out as a 19-year-old in ways that I would like to do to a few people in my life. So all of a sudden, Jesus' words about if you've ever been angry with somebody, you've actually murdered them in your soul came to, came to roost on me, right? But what is this teaching from Jesus? What is, what is going on here as Jesus, in his beauty and perfection, rolls up on shore and he sees a hillside, listen to me, 20,000 Stanley Halls, sheep, just sheep without a shepherd. And we all want to go, well, they didn't murder anybody. Oh, you see, we, we don't get it if we don't see them and if we don't see ourselves as Stanley Luke records that this teaching was about the kingdom of God. That's what, see, that's what Jesus is all about. He's like, I'm going co to come show you how to be like me, Jesus would say. Jesus would say, I'm going to come show you that living in my kingdom is like living like me. And so he's going to say, like, how do you respond to sheep when they are broken and insane that need a shepherd? How are you going to respond to that? Because as much as he is for us, he's vastly more for himself. You need to hear that today? Like, like he's vastly more that his kingdom reigns over everything that we think is important to us. And so we get challenged like with that, right? I mean, like, am I actually going to buy into that? He will become famous through us or we will hide him. And these sheep are getting taught about the good shepherd. Not only taking care of their hunger... And their earthly brokenness, but, but what he's doing here, he's inviting them to something much bigger. Let me do that for you today. I'm inviting you to something much bigger than what you're experiencing now. 
I'm inviting you to something much bigger than what you're experiencing now. The list of the concerns that you had as you pulled in this parking lot today are minuscule compared to the kingdom of God that what God wants to do in and through you. And so let me right-size you before him today. These sheep are getting taught about a kingdom that will never end, and that, will, that they, there is a world where they will never stop praising and glorifying an amazing king. It's an invitation to see all things from a heaven to earth perspective instead of ourselves as the center of things. That's it. That's what the invitation is. Me coming out of the center, Jesus going into the center. Verse 35 says this, And when it grew late, his disciples came to him. This is a desolate place and the hour is late. We're at the center. I know we just went out on, I know we just went out on a mission for you. We were full of the Spirit. We got to do all kinds of things. But right now, we're at the center because we want you to send these people away because we need to center here. Are you, are you tracking with this? Like, this is a desolate place and the hour is late. Send them away into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy them something to eat. That is so us. We see brokenness. We are tired. God, could you just kind of like tell those people to get a job? Could you just tell them like to pick themselves up by their bootstraps? Like glorious me has done time and time again in the middle of my self-righteousness and done. And we, and we guise it in a prayer request. Like help them, Lord. Lord, help them. Help them, Lord. So here's Jesus' response to you today. To me, if the Spirit has stirred compassion, he says, Stop thinking somebody needs to do something for you. That's what the disciples are doing. Like, send them into the, into the town and, and let's get them something. Let's find somebody who can give them something to eat. How many times do we think that? Like, we see brokenness around. We go, man, somebody needs to do something about that. Look at Jesus' response here. You do it. Verse 37, but he answered them. What does he say? Read it with me. You give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. I just sent you out, he says, and you heal the sick and you cast out demons. And you think you have no power? It says to you in these seats today, you have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead residing in you if you're a believer in this room. Let me say that to you again, just in case you didn't hear you have the same power that raised Jesus from the dead residing in you. There's nothing you can't do. Jesus could not have been shocked at the response. And so we don't want to be self-righteous and criticize. But what do we do? Because often that's what we say to Jesus. But what do we do? We, we don't know what to do. We whine a little bit. Anybody ever catch yourself with a little whine? We just kind of complain all the time. Here's what's astonishing. Jesus, let me, let me, here. Jesus knew by the Spirit that every one of these 20,000 people would reject him. Here's what we want. We want true karma. I'll do something for them, but somebody's got to do something for me. That's not Jesus. Jesus just goes like, I know all 20,000 are going to walk away from me. And right now, I just see brokenness and I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to call them to believe in me, but it's, it's not a game of I'll do this if you'll do this. If anybody who's been around me very long knows that my definition of human love is I will love you when, and you just fill in the blank, when you do these things, I will love you. And that's not the way of Jesus. That's not love, that's Hinduism. Verse 38, and he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. That's what Jesus is always doing to you. He's going, how much do you, what do you got? Well, Americans hate answering that. Because we got more than this young boy who's going to give up his sack lunch, right? We have more than just a few loaves and a couple of fish. But we think it's ours. And the little boy says, here's my lunch. All of it. He doesn't say like, Oh, hold on, Jesus, you can have like one loaf and one fish because I've still got to eat. 
He just like pours it all out. We had, we had Dave Ramsey's folks in here this week, and, and we did a little TV show, and we'll get that out to you at some point if you want to see me wreck Dave Ramsey's teaching with the gospel. It's fantastic. Because it's really easy to think that Dave Ramsey's teaching's for us. Everybody track with that? Like, like if I just get Dave Ramsey's, Ramsey's principles right, the American dream will come flowing on me, and my life will get better instead of this is going to free up all kinds of fishes and loaves to take care of the Great Commission throughout the world. Whoa! Now you, you sound like Sigma. We must, we must be changed. Verse 39, then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass, so they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties, more references to Moses and taking care of his sheep in Israel, but Jesus is the better Moses. So Jesus gets them in an organized way here so that his miracle is efficient. And then we can, we can, the American church can do what he did with the organization. And it can look like something extraordinary is happening. But what we can't do is change the molecular structure of a little bit of food into a lot of food. So oftentimes we settle for the organization of something that looks like it's really producing something, and we forget to access the supernatural power of God that would actually do something that makes a difference, right? So, so he does something here that we can't do. Only God's power can produce something here. In verse 41, and taking the five loaves and two fish, all right, look what he does now. He looks to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to disciples to set before the people, and he divided the two fish among them all. Miracle! Anybody in the room excited about the fact that God can do something like that? Like, he can still do something like that? Like, that's a miracle, right? But look what he does first. He looked to heaven. See, we want to perform the miracle, but we want to look to heaven. In the middle of a death to self, in the middle of a trip to the tomb, we go, God... Um, at the end of the day, like, I think I deserve this, and so I need you to. But we don't, we don't like, depend, dependence on prayer. Jesus, in his 100% manhood, did what we have to do. He, he looked to heaven. I appreciate that about Jesus, that he set aside some of his attributes, and he said, I'm going to walk just like you walk, completely filled with the Holy Spirit, completely dependent on the Spirit, completely at the whim of whether God wants to the Father wants to do something through me in this moment to show us that's how we have to do it. He looked to heaven for his Father to restore, to heal, to feed. And listen to me, everyone ate. Everyone ate. There were unsatisfied people, and he didn't play a game there when, and, and say, like, when you believe in me, I'll feed you. He just flows in abundance here. Their brokenness was addressed. But I want to caveat this for you. The fact that their brokenness was addressed doesn't mean that they were broken in their spirit. Some of you have had your brokenness addressed in the past and not had broken, a broken spirit. There were some lepers, right? Remember this story from the Bible? There were some lepers who skin was falling off of them from full leprosy. Jesus heals 10 of them. Nine of them took the idea that their brokenness had been addressed, but their spirit was not broken, and so they did not believe in Jesus. They did not repent and believe in the one who took walking dead like zombie skin falling off of them, made it look like a baby's butt, and they walked away like, we deserved it showed it to the priest, and never believed in Jesus. We're only going to see one of the ten in heaven, probably, as far as we know. Let's make sure that's not us, where our brokenness is getting addressed and filled, but we're not, we're not ourselves broken in our spirit, refusing to submit. See, when pressed, these people, we know from John 6, these people were pressed to give up their lives in response to God's love and grace, because he, here's what Jesus does. He says, um, if you're broken in your spirit, I'm going to ask you for everything. Not some little 
um, prayer at an altar, I'm, I'm going to ask you for your, your all. So many people operate out of their brokenness, but they're not broken. Broken as in done in. Submitted to the Savior of the world. Because he does that in John 6, right? He, he, he turns to him and he goes, like, I need all of you. How many are left? Those of you who know John 6, how many are left? Disciples. And he goes, what, are you not going to leave me too? They had a good answer. Where else would we go, right? <laughs> but these people, are, these people who, he, who he's just miraculously fed are currently still in triage. Some of them may get saved later. Right? They're not dead. He didn't smoke them like he should have. Could have. Been completely justified, right? What's the penalty for sin? Death. All you do is go, you're done. But he doesn't do that. They walk away after having been completely satisfied, and who knows what happened for them later. But I want you to hear this. Listen to this for you, for you this morning. Be encouraged here. In the moment, uh, the blessings from God was completely abundant. Look, look at verse 42. And they all ate, read it with me, and they were satisfied. What's the word? Satisfied. So much so they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. So there were women and children. There were probably 20,000 people here just got fed with a kid's sack lunch, right? An amazing physical miracle, but no more miracle than the gospel, right? I mean, like, no more miracle than I have been disobedient to God. I've hated God with all of my essence of being, and he comes and lives perfectly a life that I couldn't live and dies sacrificially on a cross when he's done nothing wrong. He takes my sin. That's a miracle. The fact that you might be in this place and believe it today, considering that you have nothing good in you that would connect with that, is a miracle. His salvation is abundant. It is overflowing. It is incomprehensible. It's unbelievable. So how can we react to that in some sedate, mundane way? Because we've been trained quite sufficiently. If you're white in the room, suburban people kill any ability to be excited about that. (laughs) The death is a miracle. Miraculously defeated to bring new life. And now in our faithful belief, listen to what happens. We eat of the bread of life, and we are satisfied, are we? Like, like, like we eat of the bread of life, and we are, are satisfied. So now Paul comes back, and he goes, um, all of you that believe, just remember that you, you're completely satisfied. You don't have to live a life of American discontentment. The word contentment can come to your soul. Because there can't be anything better happen for you. These people got to eat one meal. They're going to get hungry again. You tracking with this? Your soul never has to be hungry again. Your soul never has to be hungry again. If you're in this room and you have received Christ, if you've been filled with his spirit, your soul never has to be hungry again. We can slip into a realm of discontentment for a moment, for a day, but you don't have to stay there. Because his abundance is complete. His blessings are complete. This, is no, this lacks nothing. There are 12 baskets left over. People ate a lot. It was, like, it was like all my relatives from Booger County at a buffet, man. I mean, like they got their money. Goodness. Can we celebrate? I mean, like, I mean really, can we celebrate? Abundant life. Abundant life. If you don't have a, if you're a believer in this room and you don't have abundant life today, and I'm not talking about like some people, you know, you get like stuff. I'm talking about like your soul is satisfied. It's you. It's not because God's like some kind of, I think, I think honestly some of us are mad at him because we think he's like a playful marionette, right? Like, I mean, like a puppeteer, right? And we, he's just dancing us on a string, 
That's not it, man. He's, wanting, he's standing here wanting to flow stuff through us, wanting us to be a, a celebratory people, a people of praise and thanksgiving today, yes? Complete satisfaction in this moment. Jesus, Jesus never leaves us lacking. We might reject him enough that we feel like we're lacking, but he never leaves us lacking. So here's our communion summary today. We're going to take communion together. I want you to visibly look at this. Here's our summary. Number one, we are needy. Okay? We are needy, spiritually hungry. Jesus looks on our need. You are the people up on the shore, right? And he looks up at you, and you've been a sheep without a shepherd, and he looks upon you, and he, full of compassion, completely feeds you today with all that you need. And so the question is, as you come take communion, do you believe it? I mean, like, do you believe it? Is it who you are? Is it the essence of your soul? So much compassion that he feeds us with his death. Okay? Two. Through miraculous intervention, he takes care of our need. We're needy. We're hungry. And so his question to you in the middle of presenting his gospel to you, is this sufficient is the fact that I have died for you and through my death forgiven every sin. So in this room, you are like, listen, you're like, you are completely clean. Doesn't matter what you've done in this room, you are completely clean. Completely clean, white as snow. Is that satisfactory? The blood of life comes inside of us and we have the ability to never be hungry again. See, we have a hard time with that because we know that we're like these people who gorge themselves on bread and fish and the next morning we'll wake up and we'll go, man, I'm hungry. So we question that because of our own physicality. And then number three, the satisfaction is complete. Complete. <laughs> we do not need to search for the next best thing. The reason we're all confused is the culture has told us we need something besides him. You will be satisfied when it's Jesus plus, and you fill in the blank with whatever you struggle with. You'll be satisfied when it's Jesus plus something else. And we buy in, and so we're never quite sure that he's satisfactory, but we have perfection gifted. All, the, all that is righteous about Jesus has been gifted to you. So here's our big idea this morning. Just let this wash over you. God miraculously takes care of our needs. All of you have eaten, right? Emotional. If you've been broken, you don't have to stay in that brokenness. He can heal you emotionally. For some of you, it's time to get out of triage. He's given you all that you need. He is the great healer, the great physician. You don't have to stay there. If I would say this, if you're not healed, it's probably because you enjoy being broken and it defines you. And so it's time to say, I'm done with that. I'm ready for Jesus to heal my emotions. And then spiritual, the cross is enough. The resurrection is enough. Death has been defeated. It is done. Can we receive it? These miracles often go unnoticed in our day because we're caught up in those things that the world has told us we need to pay attention to to be complete, the Jesus plus. And so if my mind is made up on a Monday that nothing can detour the completeness of his satisfaction in me, nothing will compete in the completeness of his satisfaction in me because that's what the Spirit is wanting to do in us. <laughs> the indwelling nature of God's wanting to do that. So let's pay attention and instead of being a people of discontentment, which has no say with our culture, they're all discontented. And so when Christians are discontented right with them, they go, well, why the heck would I want to be like you? You're just like me. But if they would see the great apologetic of I'm satisfied and content, and I'm a people of praise and thanks, yeah, I've got cancer. I've got massive relational dysfunction with people, members of my family. There's brokenness all around me, but I'm not broken. I'm humble and submitted broken, but I'm not broken anymore because I'm completely satisfied in who I am. I know my eternity is set because he has set it. We become a people of thanks and praise. Yes? And people will come to faith around you because that's what they're waiting for. They're waiting for somebody to be satisfied because everything that they're trying with all their friends is failing. 
Everybody, th- everybody says, man, the, the, the great post-Christianity is, is the, the, the negative culture is winning. It, it does look like it's winning, but then it's failing. It has to fail. There's no completeness to it. We know that. And so if we would just stay the course, people will come to faith. So let's not walk away when challenged. Let's walk forward in faith. Let's be a celebratory people. See, the feeding of the 5,000, the 20,000 is completely about communion. I believe that Jesus, this is, this is Jesus providing food. I believe he's provided all that we need and complete satisfaction in his perfectness. His completeness satisfies us. That you could thank and praise him for such a thing. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read you an ancient prayer from Bernard. And I just want to leave this up on the screen while you come to communion. Why it's not just some, some rote act of, yeah, this is what we do. We go take communion. But, it, but I'm actually coming up and I'm going like, like, holy cow. Like, I just read about you like physically feeding people and then feeling, feeling complete. And everything about us now is contemplating as, as I'm doing that. Is that a symbol of me feeling like I'm just completely satisfied? And that's what needs a process. Let me, let me read this, this prayer to you. We taste thee, O living bread. O thou living bread, and long to feast upon thee still. We drink of thee the fountainhead and thirst our souls from thee to fill.